and something to eat. <laughs> okay, today is October the 26th, 2017. We'll prepare ourselves in our usual fashion, whereby we acknowledge to God the Father any unconfessed sins, which ensures the filling of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your immutability. You change not, nor does your word. But it seems like everything else is changing and most of it is not for the good. So we have a great opportunity to be that light and that salt that you called us to be. We can't do that unless we are not only biblically literate, but that we have discernment in applying your word. So we pray that you will help us to focus and concentrate as we come close to the end of the discernment review. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. There's a two-paragraph little article here that I was going to relate to you, which is just pretty much what is going on these days. It came from the Family Research Council, and it, came, uh, it was written three days ago. And it's talking about Roy Cooper, who is the governor of North Carolina. Now, I'm thinking, I don't think that's the governor when, uh, maybe it was in 2016, when he refused to kowtow uh, to the LGBT, and he said he made the statement that you have to use the restroom of your birth, uh, biological birth certificate, and they got all in a dither about it, and uh, uh, some of the pro basketball teams and uh, wouldn't play there, and I know um, PayPal and some other corporations pulled out and all. That wasn't this guy, was it? I'm pretty sure it wasn't. Does anybody can confirm that? It, it can't be. Evidently, there was an election that somebody else took his place. But anyway, I'm going to tell you who this is. It wouldn't make sense if it was that same governor. It was North Carolina that made that stand. So, anyway, uh, the title of this, these two paragraphs, Voters in a Lather Over Lib Bathroom Order. Roy Cooper isn't a legislator, but that hasn't stopped the North Carolina governor from acting like one. So he is the governor of North Carolina, and when you see what he's doing, it's just the opposite of what his, uh, the governor prior to him, how he acted. So it has to be a different guy. So Roy Cooper isn't a legislator. Le legislator. Now, the governor works for what branch of government? The executive branch. Can the executive branch legislate? No. No. Now, we're talking about federal. We know that from the federal constitution, but the states are the same. So there is a, uh, this has become very familiar with us where you have someone that is in the executive branch that is acting as if they're in the legislative branch. And he, what he did is just wanted to change things, and so he made an executive order that essentially carried the weight of law. I wonder where he got that idea. Anyway, it says that he's not a legislator, but it didn't stop him from acting like one. Months after voters thought the bathroom issue was at least temporarily settled, settled, the state's liberal leader decided to reignite North Carolina fight with the executive order that's outraging people on both sides. Now, the reason they think they, everybody thought that it was a temporarily settled issue was because they came to agreement that they weren't going to make any decision on this till 2020, and in the meantime, things would stay as it was. But this governor evidently took over, and he's, he's muddying the waters. Despite agreeing to a compromise, 
bill in March, Cooper is shocking everyone by wading back into the bathroom debate with a mandate that undermines the very legislation he signed. Under that law, HB 142, North Carolina put the brakes on any local ordinances that would fling open bathroom showers, locker rooms, and bathrooms to people of both sexes until 2020. And so what it's saying that he voted on this, or he went along with this legislation that he signed, but now he's going against that. In the meantime, it left the regulation of those privacy policies to the legislature. Not colleges, city councils, or state agencies. Now, the reason he's saying these colleges, city councils, and state agencies is because those areas in every state are getting the idea that they can do the same thing that if you are a college uh, person uh, on a board that you can d decide uh, along these lines where that if you are a male and you want to go into a female's locker room, bathroom, or shower, then you are able to do it. And th that's happening by city councils as well. In, in San Antonio and in Austin, we have those that are of that ilk. State agencies are not able to do that either. The only way that you can do that lawfully is for the legislature to pass legislation. And in doing that, it has to be constitutional or it is what? No. Null and void. Seems like nobody's going back to the fundamentals to put that together. Cooper has unilaterally decided to change that policy with a decree that not only lets grown men back into girls' restrooms, but forces local businesses to embrace his transgender agenda or lose their government partnerships. In other words, if you want to do a government job and you're going to put a bid in on a job, if you don't submit to this bathroom agenda deal, you won't even be considered. So it says, uh, but forces, he forces the local businessmen to embrace his transgender agenda or lose their government partnerships. Ignore your conscience and public safety concerns, the governor has decided, or kiss your North Carolina contracts goodbye. Now that's all there was. There was it was a lot longer than that, but I just thought I'd throw out that salient part for you to recognize that this is an ongoing thing. I doubt it's going to ever stop. Well, I know it will stop. Well, I know when Christ returns, it's going to stop. But in the meantime, we can see this and maybe even getting worse. I don't know. But if you were here Sunday and you saw Judge Roy Moore and his a video, uh, then you should be inspired to not keep your mouth shut. This is not a time to be silent. It's a time to stand up for what is right. He said it's easy when he refused to take the Ten Commandments off of the courthouse uh, area, and he said, well, I just it was easy. It wasn't hard to try to figure out. I just did what was right. That's the problem is that they're trying to erase the difference between what's right and what's wrong is if whatever you want to do, some gray area in the middle is okay, and that's nonsense. Okay, we're going to continue tonight with our discernment review series. We're on lesson 37, and we are currently on what? Do you remember? Money, 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 money. money. And what we spent most of the time on last, this past Tuesday was eternal life and how many times it is not used salvifically and of course sometimes it has also to do uh, with uh, money and that's how we originally started in that area but while we were on that eternal life not being uh, how many times it's used not being salvifically not used salvifically 
I'll just give you, I'm not going to read the verses, I'm just going to give you some addresses, okay? Matthew 19, 29. That says, and they, sh and, and they shall inherit eternal life. Well, that word inherit, you know, can't be the righteousness that we, uh, or the eternal life that we get from God because that is imputed. That was Matthew 19, 29. And then we had Mark 10, 17. Again, the last few words of that is, I do not inherit eternal life. Or the question is, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? This is not salvific. And you know when I'm talking about salvific, I'm talking about it has nothing to do with eternal salvation. John chapter 6, verse 26 through 27. But labor for the spiritual food that endures to eternal life or results in eternal life. We are to labor. Imputed righteousness has nothing to do with labor or work, so that's another one. Then we had Romans chapter 2, verse 7. To those who persevere in doing good, seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. We don't have to seek for eternal life of, that's imputed to us. We have it the moment we believe in Jesus Christ. This is talking about an experiential type of eternal life. Galatians chapter 6, verse 8. But one who sows to the Spirit shall from the Spirit reap eternal life. Sowing has what element in it? Works. So again, that can't have anything to do with eternal life and eternal salvation. Titus chapter 3, verse 7. We might be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We don't have to hope for eternal life. We already have it. We have confidence in eternal life, but we might hope for the experiential type of eternal life. Otherwise, it's a done deal. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse, 6 through, uh, verse 10 through 12. 1 Timothy 6 Verse 10 through 12. Take hold of eternal life to which you were called. Taking hold of it is living your life, your experience on earth, in such a way that you can be rewarded with the abundant life that God wants us all to live. 1 Timothy 6, verse 18 and 19. Again, it says, Take hold of that which is life indeed. And that's Ione Zoe. Referring to that eternal life. 1 John 3 15. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. That's 1 John 3 15. And I said the whole, the whole meaning of that phrase there has to do with. Whether it says you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Or whether it says not every murderer has eternal life in him. And it's, it's, it is translated both ways depending on what version you're reading. But the, it appears that the great majority translate this phrase that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. And that makes it experiential. If you're a murderer, you don't have that abundant life. You don't have that experiential type of eternal life in you or you would be murdering someone. But if it was talking about imputed eternal life and you are a believer, you can still murder. So if no murderer has this kind of eternal life, then it has to be experiential. And then the last one I have here is Jude chapter 1, verse 20 through 21. And the, it, it, verse 21 ends by saying, For the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. See, that's future. If it's talking about something that is present, in the present tense, eternal life, that's something that we already have received at initially at salvation. 
If, if it's something yet to receive, then that's experiential because that's something that we have to earn, we have to work for. Okay, I just wanted to get that to you because you might not have been here and you have those verses now down, and that's uh, important to know. Those who base their security on money aren't very wise. I ended this last time. It's one of my favorite verses. I think it's my favorite. It is not nearly. It is my favorite verse when it comes to money. It's in Proverbs 23, verse 4 through 5. Do not weary yourself to gain wealth. Cease from your consideration of it. When you set your eyes on it, it is gone. For wealth certainly makes itself wings like an eagle that flies towards the heavens. I can't tell you how many times I looked in my wallet and that's what I thought. I don't know where it had. It had to sprout wings and leave. Or looking at a bank account, that type of thing. Proverbs chapter 28 verse 20. A faithful man will abound with blessing, but he who makes haste to be rich will not go unpunished. Wow. A faithful man will abound with blessings, but he who makes haste to be rich will not go unpunished. Now, I'm, I'm not going to dig too deep into this, but it, it brings to my mind something. And I, Well, I'll just put this as a question. You heard that verse. A faithful man will abound in blessings, but he who makes, who makes haste to be rich will not go unpunished. Would that, would that apply to a gambler? Do you think? I like to th make these things practical. So I'm wondering, would that apply to a gambler? Because a gambler, I would assume, would like to get rich quick. Uh, and I'm not trying, I know that there are people who have a profession of being gamblers. And I also know that when you start pointing your finger at people who uh, go to Las Vegas or whatever, and they play cards or roulette or whatever, and they gamble... And you look down at them, well, they say, well, do you own any stocks? Because if you own stock, then you're pretty much of a gambler as well, aren't you? So I'm not going to go too far in those weeds, but I thought I would put that into a perspective for you to think about, but not right now. How about money and happiness? We all know that money can't buy happiness. But I've got a few little tidbits here that I researched uh, to find these, and it gives you some cases where it would show that money does not buy happiness. Keith Nicholson won $426,495 in the British soccer pool. His wife announced that he was going to spend, spend, spend. I want to make sure I read that right. His <laughs> wife announced that he was going to spend, spend, spend. It didn't have an S in front of he, like a she. Anyway, you'd have to see it, I guess. But look what happened to the money and the Nicholsons. They bought a luxury home for $47,600. Now, this had to be way back then. Yeah. Uh, that might buy a luxury car now. Um, so they bought a luxury home for $47,600. Before they hit the jackpot, they rented city houses, housing for $5.43 uh, a week. That was, uh, they rented by the week, round that off to $6 a week, that'd be $24 a month. So that wasn't any time recently. No. They gave parties almost every night. In four years, they managed to spend $196,000. We had oodles of money, reported Mrs. Nicholson, but we lost our friends the people we had known in the old days and whom we really wanted to see never came by. In 1966, Nicholson was killed in a crash in the $5,600 car bought out of his winnings from the jackpot money. $107,113 went to the government in death taxes, which, by the way, should not be. The remainder was invested half in a trust for the three children, half to give Mrs. Nicholson a $25 a week income. And you might think, well, that might be an aberration. Most people do better than that when they win scads of money, but it is not. 
if you, if you see a list of the people who have won the lottery and have gotten very wealthy very quickly, most of them say if they had to do it over again, they would never want that to happen. Because the friends that you have, you usually lose. And those that you didn't know, maybe family members come out of the woodwork. <laughs> Hello, cousin. John Jacob Astor left five million but had been a martyr to dyspepsia and melancholy. I had looked up dyspepsia, but I can't remember what it is. Anybody know? Stomach problems. Stomach problems. Tressie was here. She could tell us. She's a nurse now. And is Morgan a nurse? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, and he said, I am the most miserable man on earth. That was John Jacob Astor. I remember that name because I used to know a song by that. Y'all remember it? John Jacob, Jingle Hunter Smith. John Jacob, isn't in Astor in there somewhere? Maybe not, I don't know. Well, scratch that one. Henry Ford, the automobile king, said, quote, Work is the only pleasure. It is only work that keeps me alive and makes life worth living. I was happier when I was doing a mechanic's job. That was Henry Ford. Andrew Carnegie, the multimillionaire, said, Millionaires seldom smile. This next quote comes from Benjamin Franklin. I wouldn't have guessed it, but I'll tell you who wrote it before. He said, quote, Money never made a man happy, nor will it. There is nothing in its nature to produce happiness. The more a man has, the more he wants. Instead of its Instead of its filling a vacuum, it makes one. If it satisfies one want, it doubles and triples what the, uh, that want another way. That was a true proverb of this wise man. Rely upon it. Quote, better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great tre treasure and trouble therewith. And that was by Benjamin Franklin. And then just a few little lines here. Money will buy a fine dog, but only love will make it wag its tail. The poorest man I know is the man who has nothing but money. And that was by John D. Rockefeller, Jr. The late Robert Horton said, The greatest lesson he learned from life was that people who set their minds and hearts on money are equally disappointed whether they get it or whether they don't. I'm going to read that one again. Isn't it great? The, because it has to do with those who set their minds on money. Remember what I read just a minute ago? Let me go back up here to the scriptures I was saying. In Proverbs 23 verse 4, do not wear yourself to gain wealth. Cease from your consideration of it. When you set your eyes on it, or when you set your mind on it, it is gone. For wealth certainly makes wings for itself, and like an eagle it flies towards heaven. I'm, I was thinking about that when this guy says it. He says again, Robert Harton said the greatest lesson he learned from life was that people who set their minds and hearts on money. Doesn't matter whether you get it or whether you don't, you're going to be disappointed. He says, when you set your hearts on money, are equally disappointed whether they get it or whether they don't. So what is that saying? Don't set your mind on money. It can bring you happiness, and it can multiply your woes. If you, if you inherited a lot of money or won a lot of money, all you got is more things to deal with. And then this is, I don't know if this was, this is a, a I guess this is a poem, I guess, I don't know, but I have it centered in the middle of my page here. Money will buy the following. This is the, what money will buy. A bed, but not sleep. Books, 
but not brains. Food, but not appetite. Finery, but not beauty. A house, but not a home. Medicine, but not health. Luxuries, but not culture. Amusement, but not happiness. A crucifix, but not a savior. A church pew, but not heaven. So, uh, I want you to take your Bibles and turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 1. And it's hot in here. Can, Charlie, can you do something about that, please? We won't be saying that tomorrow night. <laughs> Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Ecclesiastes comes right after what? Proverbs, right. Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Who wrote Ecclesiastes? Solomon. Solomon. What else did he read? What else did he write? Solomon. Okay, very good. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, oh, excuse me, chapter 2, verse 1. This has to do with the futility of pleasure and wealth. Futility of that. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 verse 1. I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure. So enjoy yourself and behold, it too was futility. So he's saying right off the bat that he was going to see what would bring him happiness, would pleasure bring happiness and fulfillment and contentment. And he said, behold, it too was futility. Verse 2. I said of laughter, it is madness. And of pleasure, what does it accomplish? I explored with my mind how to stimulate my body with wine while my mind was guiding me wisely and how to take hold of folly until I could see what good there is for the sons of men to do under heaven the few years of their lives. Now, you're going to see in Ecclesiastes, it's a dark tone to much of what he's saying in Ecclesiastes. Because here you have Solomon, the son of David, who was the most richest man in the world and at one time was the wisest man in the world. But he disobeyed God. He started marrying foreign women, which God commanded him not to do. And as always happens, it turned his head away from God. He was in big time reversionism, and he had the wealth, he had the time, he had the, everything that he needed to go through all these different things to see what would make him happy. And all the way through this whole thing, he says, vanity of vanities, it's all empty. Now, we can do that maybe on a minor scale. He did it on a huge scale. Of course, one of the areas that he was going to explore was sex, and he, I would assume he had quite a bit because he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. So he put a nix on that as well. Verse 4, I enlarged my works. I built houses for myself. I planted vineyards for myself. I made gardens and parks for myself. And I planted in them all, in them all kinds of fruit trees. Now I want you to, you might even want to underline this, starting with, with verse 4. For myself, for myself, for myself. Do you see that? Three times in those two verses. And any time you're doing things for yourself, I mean we... I'm not condemning doing things for yourself. But he's trying to find happiness. And you will never find happiness doing for yourself. That's a key ingredient to remember. If you ever want to seek happiness, don't seek 
to find pleasure and happiness in by pleasing yourself because it will never come. Happiness can come from trying to make others happy or helping them. Verse 6. I made ponds of water for myself from which to irrigate a forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves and I had home-born slaves. I also possessed flocks and herds larger than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. And his, by the way, his herds counted into the hundreds of thousands. Verse 8. Also I collected for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I provided for myself male and female singers and the pleasure of men, many concubines. Then I, become, I became great and increased more than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. My wisdom also stood by me. And all that my eyes desired, I did not refuse them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure, for my heart was pleased because of all my labor, and this was my reward for all my labor. Now, that ver what he's saying in that verse is that there is pleasure in the sense of doing a job well done. And the only way, reason that you can do that is it is a reward from God. It's a reward. It is a gift from God that you have a job, that there is something for you to do, and you having the ability to do it. There's a lot of people who can't work. There are people who are physically disabled, mentally disabled. And a lot of people may want work and can't find it. So that's the context of that. Verse 11. Thus I considered all my activities which my hands had done and the labor which I had exerted, and behold, all was vanity and striving after the wind, and there is no profit under the sun. Just think of that. He said, I did anything my heart desires. And he had the means to do it. He ends by saying, it's all vanity. Striving after the wind, then there was no profit under the sun. Verse 12. So I turned to consider wisdom, madness, and folly. For what will man do who will come after the king except what he has already done? And I saw that wisdom excels folly as light excels darkness. The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. And yet I know that one fate befalls them all. Is that true? If you're saying death, you could say, yes, that's true. But what about beyond death? It's not true. Verse 15. Then I said to myself, as is the fate of the fool, it will also befall me. Why then have I been extremely wise? So I said to myself, this too is vanity. Do you see how depressing this is? He's talking about death. He's saying, what good is it that I did all these things and, and that I was wise because my end is going to be the same as the fool's in the ground. I'm going to die. That's the horrible attitude that he has here. Verse 16, for there is no lasting remembrance of the wise man as with the fool, inasmuch as in the coming days all will be forgotten. And how the wise man and the fool alike die. That's what he's saying. Now this is, I want you to recognize, this is totally stinking thinking, human, point, human viewpoint, mental attitude. He has no sense of eternal destiny. Verse 17. So I hated life for the work which had been done under the sun was grievous to me because everything is futility and striving after the wind. Well, if you have a human view viewpoint attitude, it's easy to come to that conclusion. That's why so many people take their lives in this country, probably around the world, is because they have the same thinking that Solomon is expressing here and they commit suicide. Did you know that 66% of the uh, gun, uh, people who are killed by guns is, is uh, 
Suicide? 66%. So when they give you the statistics of how many people are killed by guns, they don't ever say, yeah, but 66% of that suicide. But anyway. Verse 18. Thus I hated all the fruit of my labor for which I had labored under the sun, for I must leave it to the man who will come after me. I mean, if you can't enjoy the things that God has blessed you with because you're afraid that when you die, someone else is going to get it, you've got a stinking thinking going on there. 19. And who knows whether he will be a wise man or a fool, yet he will have control over all the fruit of my labor, which I have labored by acting wisely under the sun. This too is vanity. Therefore, I completely despaired of all the fruit of my labor for which I had labored under the sun. When there is a man who has labored with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, then he gives his legacy to one who has not labored with them. He's talking about his father David here, by the way. This too is vanity and a great evil. You know, if you are fortunate enough, or maybe I should say unfortunate enough, to inherit great wealth, and you didn't work. I mean, it was given to you. You didn't work for it. A lot of people can't handle that. They have no sense of accomplishment and a job, job well done. So usually what they do is just pursue what Solomon pursued, pleasure, and not withhold anything from what you want. And they wind up like Solomon saying, vanity of vanities, it does not satisfy. Verse 22. For what... What does a man for what does a man get in all his labor and in his striving with which labors under the sun? Because all his days his task is painful and grievous. Even at night his man his mind does not rest. This too is vanity. Well, if you're thinking like him, I can understand why you wouldn't sleep at night either. He's bitter, he's discouraged, he's disappointed. And all because he's got divine viewpoint. There is no personal sense of eternal destiny. He's not claiming any promises from God about God, how God rewards the faithful. And the phenomenal things that we have to look forward to, not only in this life, but in the one to come, he is stinking viewpoint throughout. Now turn to page, I mean, excuse me, chapter 5 in Ecclesiastes here. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, and let's start with verse 8. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 8. Now, normally I have in my notes here, starting at verse 10, but I have a pericope break right before 8. Do any of y'all have that? Okay, so I'm going to start at 8, and I have a circle and a sunburst around the number eight, and that's my little code to say, now hear this. So I'm going to start at eight. If you see oppression of the poor and denial of justice and righteousness in the province, do not be shocked at the sight. For one official watches over another official, and there are higher officials over them. What is that trying <laughs> What is that trying to tell you? Boy, do we have that in space today, do we not? Don't be shocked at all this denial of justice and righteousness because what this is essentially saying is all these high officials have each other's back and they try to cover each other uh, for what they, what all the ill they do. Verse 9, after all, a king who cultivates the field is an advantage to the land. Now, verse 10. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money. I want you to underline that. Put a star verse by it. That's all you need. Right there. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money. Nothing wrong with money. Nothing wrong with having money. But you shouldn't love money. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor... He who loves abundance with its income. 
And this too is vanity. A lot of people say, I don't, I don't lust after money. I don't love money. I just love everything it can buy. And this covers that as well. Verse 11. When good tiding, well, excuse me, when good things increase, those who consume them increase. <laughs> In other words, these people who, uh, some rock star, and he hits it big, and he has good things that are increased, then he's got to have a security detail. He has to have a, a driver, a chauffeur. He has to have a cook. He has to have lawyers and accountants, and on and on and on. That's what this is talking about. So when good things increase, those who consume them increase. So what is the advantage to their owners except to look on? You're just looking it on while everybody else is taking advantage of your wealth. Verse 12. The sleep of the working man is pleasant, whether he eats little or much. But the full stomach of the rich man does not allow him to sleep. In other words, he has everything he wants. He has a full stomach. But he can't sleep because he's so worried about keeping his money. And can I invest my money and make more money? And people owe him and all the rest of it. That's what this is talking about. Verse 13. There is a grievous evil which I have seen under the sun. Riches being hoarded by their owner to his hurt. I want you to recognize that. If you're going to try to hoard what you have, it is always to your own hurt. When those riches were lost through a bad investment and he had fathered a son, then there was nothing to support him. I can understand that, but I would say you need to train your child, your son up to where he can take care of himself and not depend on what you have done. Start him out doing chores and pay him a little bit right from the beginning. Show him how to invest. Show him the value of money. We started Tuesday night on that, remember? Verse 15. As he had come naked from his mother's womb, so he will return as he came. He will take nothing from the fruit of his labor that he can carry in his hand. And this also is a grievous evil. Exactly as a man is born, thus will he die. You see, what he, he just explained what he meant by that. We don't bring anything into this world and we don't take anything out. And that is a big bother to Solomon. So what is the advantage to him who toils for the wind? I mean, if you think, I can't take anything with me and somebody else is going to get what I leave behind and I've already tried getting happiness out of all the things I've done, there is no happiness. He is a miserable person. Verse 17. Throughout his life, he also eats in darkness with great vexation, sickness, and anger. So, th this is just saying he has a gloomy existence. And this is somebody that has tremendous wealth. Last, two, uh, last three verses here. Conclusion. Here is what I've seen to be a good, to be good and fitting, to eat, to drink, and enjoy oneself and all one's labor in which he toils under the sun during the few years of his life which God has given him, for this is his reward. And what he's saying essentially, I, I would say probably this would would be relevant towards an unbeliever more than a believer because all he has is his labor. In other words, if you have a job and you really enjoy it, you feel fulfilled in doing it or whatever, he says that the, the, the uh, labor in which he toils under the sun during the few years of his life, God has given him, for this is his reward. Is that your reward? Is that the only reward that you're looking for? No. You see the human viewpoint in this? But it is true for unbelievers. That's the, he's saying that as an unbeliever or a reversionistic believer, 
then you better enjoy your work because that's all you're going to get. There is no more reward for you. Verse 19, Furthermore, as for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth, he has also employed him to eat from them and to receive his reward and rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God. And that's just doubling down on what I said just a moment ago. He's saying that you better enjoy the fact that you can eat and those who have riches and wealth, you better enjoy them. But I don't know how an unbeliever can enjoy them the way a believer can. Because most of the time, unbelievers are going to be focusing on what the wealth can buy instead of the source of that wealth. Most unbelievers, if that wealth was taken away from them, they would be destroyed. If you're a believer, a positive believer, that wealth can be taken away from you and you just, you, you, you're not even the least bit rattled because you're focusing on the source. Verse 20, for he will not often consider the years of his life because God keeps him occupied with the gladness of his heart. I think that's saying more than anything that he, he doesn't like to think about the shortness of years, how brief this time on earth is, because he's afraid he doesn't know what is next. He's, he's, he has nothing but fear and foreboding about death. And death will surely come and see every one of us here unless Christ comes, for some of us pretty soon, relatively speaking, but he could come tonight. So did you feel the gloominess in all that? And it was talking about a man who knew what he was talking about. When you look at uh, when uh, Solomon was the one that dedicated the temple. Remember, David wanted to build the temple and God said, no, we're going to let your son do that. The amount of animals that were sacrificed is incredible. I'm talking about in the hundreds of thousands. Can you imagine the administration and the thought that has to go into managing that? I mean, they didn't have all the machines that we have either. Just think if you have 100,000 sheep you have to keep them herded. They have to be watered. They have to be fed. They have to be protected. And then they have to be somehow led to the altar where they're going to be sacrificed. And then when they're sacrificed, you're going to have to have someone who's going to have... I've seen pictures that they had carts. They would put the dead lamb on there and then they would take it. And they'd have to, be, they'd have to wash it and they'd have to... Uh, they'd have to clean it and then they'd have to dis distribu uh, distribute it and all these... And that's just with sheep. What are you going to do with a uh, thousand oxen? Same thing. And all these thousands of people. He had all of that. But what he did not have is a vibrant relationship with his maker. And if you don't have Bible doctrine circulating in your stream of consciousness consistently, then you can go off the deep end just like him and get morose, melancholy, gray, foreboding in your soul. It is the light of the light in the Word that keeps us having hope. And I'm talking about Elpis kind of hope, confidence. We are confident of what's going to happen after this life because the Bible tells us. We are confident that we are God's children and He will take care of us. Now He may withdraw His hand for a reason like He did with, with uh, Job. But even then... He gives us the spiritual nourishment to carry, it, carry us through. And this is hard for us, even the, the best of believers. Look at Paul. He said he was the worst of sinners, but in my mind, <laughs> as far as I can tell, he looked like about the best, at least at his time, and yet he says he's the worst. In Romans chapter 7, that thing that I want to do, I don't do. And that thing that I don't want to do, that's exactly what I do. And yet, look at the life that he led. Remember how many times he was beaten? He was floating like a cork out in the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, two times he was in the deep. And on and on, all the suffering he did. So what I'm saying is, no matter what life throws at you, when I say life, what God allows to happen, 
We don't ever want to get into this despair of thinking divine, I mean, human viewpoint. And that is what we have by default. That is our nature to think just like he's thinking. Tonight at prayer meeting, we were praying, and I was struck by how many people had cancer. I have a, a, a neighbor. He has a place next to mine he, uh, out towards Grainvine, but he lives on the... Uh, close to the port, because he's a pilot. He ushers the big uh, ships in. And I would say he's probably 40, 45, maybe 50, I'm not sure. Just heard that he has leukemia. And I've witnessed to him. I, I don't know if he's a believer. I don't know if he's accepted the gospel. And then I think of the pastors. I can think of at least two pastors. Uh, one of them here is, is one in Brenham here. His name is Bruce Baker. And I've had uh, been fortunate enough to meet him at the uh, a couple of conferences. And when we have video con video conferences, we'll have one tomorrow morning. We have one Friday morning. Uh, I get to hear him talk to him sometimes. And uh, Lou, do you know what Lou Gehrig's disease is? It's one, probably the worst disease you can get. And to hear him talk, and re he laughs. Uh, he's a veteran. He gets some veterans' uh, help, and uh, but it's the most. It would be like being in the time of Christ, and they just said you're going to be crucified. And yet, I'll tell you this: uh, when I was at the Schaefer Conference this past one, while he was there, he was a speaker. And the very day, I think it was either before or after that he he spoke. Maybe it was before. He was going to find out that if the type of disease he had was going to be the fast kind that you go fast or whether it's going to be longer and, and whether it was going to be uh, fatal or not. And so he, I re still remember him saying this. He says, you know, he says, I'm going to go to the doctor's office tomorrow and he's going to tell me what it is. He says, but you know, he says, it's going to be good news either way. He says, if it's fast and I'm going to be with the Lord sooner, that's good. And he says, if it's not fast and I can stay here longer and be, keep serving, oh, that's good too. Now, anybody can say that. But the way he said it, I believed him. And I'm wondering, I don't know if I could do that or not. I mean, we don't know until things happen. But every day that we have a, what we might call a normal day, a lot of people think a normal day is, you know, is here and it's gone. Who cares about a normal day? You ought to give thanks. And I mean sincere thanks that you had a day that was normal. Because these people that I'm talking about, normal for them is not something you'd like to trade places with. He said last time, uh, I think it was a week, a, week, a week ago or two weeks ago, he had studied a long time for uh, a lesson for Sunday morning. And he said he was so weak, it was so hard for him. He said if he hadn't studied so long and so hard for that message, he wouldn't even try to get there, to give that message. And, and he's not trying to garner sympathy at all. He's not that type at all. And... And I'm just sitting thinking, what a phenomenal. I wonder if he knows how inspiring the words that he's saying and his attitude is. It makes me feel small. I mean, it makes me, I don't know, I'm so fortunate. Most of us here are fortunate. I know we have our aches and we have our pains and we've got ills. There's another one, uh, Mark Perkins up in, where is he? Yeah. Colorado. Colorado. And I just heard that he has, I, don't, I think it might be leukemia, some kind of horrible cancer. And they're pressing on, trying to do their job as long as they can. You know, I believe when you're in that shape, wealth doesn't mean that much to you anymore. Because you start to see things more clearly. And I think it's time for us to see things more clearly. Without having to, a, a horrible uh, death sentence on us. And I think maybe then we would appreciate what we have more and be content more with what we have.
probably people all over the world, for any of us here, would, would do anything to have our worst day. Because most of us have enough to eat. Most of us are healthy enough to get around. And there's people all over the world that are in, in fear of their very lives for a number of reasons. And we're for, so fortunate here not to have that. So I guess I'm closing on this uh, money and wealth. It takes money to survive. I understand that. We all have to pay our bills and we all work. We do things, whatever it may be, in order to pay those bills. But there's the siren song out there that is saying, oh, yes, but if you just had enough money, you could do this or you could do that. Or you see someone that they don't have to go to a restaurant and always order the cheapest thing. And you think, boy, it would be nice for me just to go in here and order anything that I want. But you know what? That is vanity of vanities and chasing after the wind. What is a meal? You can have Chateaubriand, fine wine, and sorbet. And that's, I'm running out of all the... I don't know any more than that because I've never, I've never even had any of those. But in any case, you can have all that, and how long does it last? You walk out, and you're still the same person. What? Oh, yeah, till you swallow. <laughs> you swallow and it's gone. And you might get the indigestion. You never know what's going to happen. So I guess what I'm doing is imploring all of us, me as well, to be so thankful for the things that we have. Because one way to look at it is if you don't have exceptional wealth, then you can feel somewhat sorry for those who do. Because you think that they have happiness and all the data, all the records show most of them, just like uh, John Rockefeller, J Rockefeller Jr. said, he says, millionaires don't smile. And that's because they are chasing the wind. It's nothing but vanity when you think that money can buy happiness. We're out of time. We'll continue this next time. Let's close. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that you are a God that gives us something that is so more valuable than money. More to be desired than gold, yea, much fine gold, and sweeter than honey and the honeycomb, and that is your phenomenal word. We pray that you will give us an insatiable hunger that we need it every day because it satisfies gives us contentment and courage and all the things that we want to have. And yet we're such feeble creatures that we can stray away and be distracted so easily. So we pray that you will help us to focus on your word to the point to where we have discernment. And we can tell what's right and wrong and what's evil and what's good. And that we also have the courage to stand up for it as well. We pray it all in Christ's name. Amen.